Good morning. morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Wow. Every time, you know, I come up here, I fly 300 hours to get here, uh, swim across the Pacific Ocean, and yet I'm expecting a rousing reception. Good morning. morning. There we go. That feels good. That feels like Sunday morning church, does it not? Are we excited to be in God's house together today? Yesterday we had our Stand Firm conference. Many of you were here for that. It was uh, an honor of me to be part of that. I'm thankful for the elders here and Pastor Tom to be welcoming me. But I, I do want to make a, I want to make a small complaint, if that's okay. I know it seems a bit, a bit awkward doing that at the outset. But uh, while I was up here yesterday, you know, just doing my darndest to proclaim the word of God, uh, there was this, um, there was this upstart on the front row that was mocking my accent. I don't know about intelligent, but uh, there's this constant backlash I get because people are supposing that I sound American, and I don't even know where that, I don't know where that comes from. I am a housing commission, single parent home, Logan kid, all my life. If there's any, yeah, we got a couple of you here. Praise God for that. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that's us, right? Come on. This is an Ipswich, right? This is Logan. Let's get serious about this. And uh, yet, by God's grace, we've had five, a little over five years now, ministering in the USA. Originally in East Texas, we worked in church revitalization, and now we've been in upstate New York in Rochester for a, a couple of years, serving God, proclaiming the Word, seeing God continually do His work of building His church when the Word of God is faithfully proclaimed. There is there's really nothing in this building that doesn't have a story. There's really nothing that goes on here in Hope's liturgy that doesn't have a story. I remember the first service when we introduced the London Baptist Confession and we were like 15 people and there was 15 people that were outraged. What is the London Baptist Confession? And we had to, we had to teach people about being a confessional church, about understanding the, the continuity with the historic Christian church. I remember we were building this thing. It was every single color of paint. The furor over having dark colored paint. We had a guy here that was trying to proclaim that it's in dark colored paint where demons hide. You may not have known that. You may not have known that. And uh, so we had quite the, the controversy. What probably isn't known that when this building project was going up in early 2017, 16, I actually built one wall. I, yeah, I, yeah, right? Now, I am, I am completely useless. The only, the only toolbox in our home is my wife's. I have no idea how to build or fix anything. My wife services our cars and repairs the, uh, the walls in our house. But I was so determined to be part of the building project, uh, I graduated the first week I was here. Where's Ken Broomfield? Ken's here somewhere. Ken? Me and Ken were swinging a sledgehammer, knocking down walls. Uh, I was knocking down the wrong walls. The architect was very upset with me. Uh, they were meant to stay. And I felt like I wanted to contribute, so I started with a few friends. We came in at late one night, and uh, all the tradesmen had gone home, you know, the experts, right? And so we got on the power tools, and we built a wall. That wall is not still standing. <laughs> that wall didn't even last until morning. Uh, the builder turned up at 5 a.m., saw the wall, tore it down, took photos of it while it was coming down, and sent them to me to troll me. <laughs> don't touch the tools. Stay in the Bible. We don't want your help. That was the nature uh, of the building project. But here we are, 14 years in this wonderful journey, this journey of God's grace. I still remember that first ever worship service. My wife and I turned up to the, uh, the Springwood Community Hall. And we'd been booked a space in the Springwood Community Hall, but what we hadn't been told was there was another church worshipping in the room adjacent. No one told us that. So we turned up with a kind of bright-eyed, big ideas, lots of faith, to start this church, just my wife and I. And we walked in, and this other church is there in the middle of the service. And the separation between the two rooms was this thin curtain of a wall. We're like, huh, how's this going to work? And so they ended up taking us and putting us out the back of this building in this little creche room that you couldn't fit more than nine people in. And for six months, that's where we held church, and we certainly didn't outgrow that space in short order. But God was with us, and God blessed it. And over time, in fact, there's a, a little bit of a synopsis right up in today's bulletin. So if you kind of don't grab them or you grab them but don't read them, grab today's and just have a, a bit of a read of some of the highlights of that wonderful journey, which now all of you are partakers in here at Hope Reform Baptist Church. Anyway, my, my goal is not to regale you with stories, although I would love to do that about the, the history of hope. I want you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. 
1 John chapter 4. We're going to read verse 7, 8, and 9 of this first epistle of John the Apostle, John the Beloved. Our theme today is just simply the love of God. The love of God. The love with which God has, inter-Trinitarian, expressed out in all creation, and to each and every one of us that's received the grace of God that's ours in Jesus Christ. First John 4, 7-9 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. God is love. In the providence of God, much of what I want to share with you today is reflecting on the goodness of God and his love toward each and every one of us and also spend some time today talking about how often Christians, uh, they misunderstand and they end up abusing the love of God to, to convert it into a, a license for sin. And of course, in the providence of God, that was our London Baptist Confession today. That was a, that was a long run-on sentence, right? That was like, I think, 58 words I counted in that LBC particular paragraph that we studied today. But this is, a, this is a permanent and perpetual challenge for Christians to understand living in the tension of being called to holiness and yet maintaining our confession that all of the righteousness that is in us is God, is entirely the work of God. So let's pick up this theme together, the love of God. What is the love of God not? What's God's love? What isn't God's love? Firstly, as I said, it's not license. Some people see God's love as a weakness, a softness, and they they actually seek to leverage God's love over him to their own license. I've been in pastoral ministry long enough now to, to be counseling uh, so-called Christians who are, who are stuck in the mire of the most grotesque sin you could think of, and when they're confronted on it, their response is, well, God is love, right? Well, God forgives, right? There's really no, there's no recompense for me. I, I trust in Jesus. That essentially gives me a license to do whatever I like. It's a license. People imagine that when they think about the love of God, so misconstrued is this concept and this idea that it's almost become this, 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 uh, this, this view of God as though he's just kind of weak and, and supple and malleable and, and he's able to be manipulated for personal gain. But God is love. God is love. God's love is, some have argued, the meta attribute, the, the all paradigmatic, the all controlling, the, the, the definitional attribute of who God is. And yet many Christians will say something like, well, God's love, so if I do or don't go to church, it's not really a big deal. If I sacrifice and give to the mission or obey the Great Commission, it's no big deal. If I'm able to resist sin, then that's good. If not, it's no big deal. But anyone who sees God's love as license to live in a manner unworthy of Christ seeks to profane the very essence of God's being because God is love. Offending the very root of who God is is barely compelling evidence that you are truly born again. God's love isn't object aggrandizing. Now, whilst that first one, God's love isn't license, has become a, a fairly pernicious way for Christians to live, I would say this one, this second point that I will offer you this morning, is all prevailing. There is an idea among modern Christendom or, or modern evangelicalism that God's love is all about you. This, this flatters you. This, this gives you a, a sense of glory and prominence and prowess. God loves you. And it almost boils down to, can you even believe that God loves you? Have you thought about that? You must be so innately lovely. Well, that's really, that's really anti-gospel. The fact that God loves any one of us, wretched, vile sinners though we are, is not a credit to us at all. It's a credit to Him. In fact, so, so debased are we in and of ourselves, in and of our Adamic nature, so fallen are we that for God to love us only aggrandizes and glorifies Him. Yet many Christians have contorted and distorted the gospel of Jesus Christ into a false idea that the gospel inflates views of yourself. Always run, always flee from that kind of teaching. You are not the hero of the gospel. Jesus is. 
And that God loved you even while you and I were yet sinners, even in our state of helplessness and unworthiness, makes much of him. So the Lord our God loves us. We're called to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now that's, I can't tell you how many conferences and seminars and events, even books I've read or modern worship songs that are, that are written that perpetually aggrandize the sinner because God loved them and the object of God's love must be to them infinitely lovely. But God shows us this love, God, God's intervention, God's coming into this world and arresting us in our plight of damnation demonstrates his greatness, his goodness, his unfathomable mercy and depthless grace. Thirdly, I'm racing through these because these are really preparatory. God's love is not needy. God's love is not needy. God's love for finite creatures is not because of some lack in himself. He loves us because he is glorified in the expression of his perfections. I remember being in a large conference one time, and they brought in this, this big celebrity preacher. And it was, I'm talking like thousands of people filled this, this, uh, this convention center. And this big celebrity preacher came in and he was talking about the, the, about the experience of, of God before creation. And as he was going on and rambling on about this God before creation, he then says, and God created Adam and Eve because he wanted company. Because he was lonely. Now I'm thankful that when I just said that, there was at least a minor groan in the crowd here this morning. Because that was not the case in that convention center. There was rapturous applause. Could, could you imagine how flattering it is to a sinner to be told that even God sitting off on his lonesome, twiddling his thumbs, wondering, where are all my friends? I know what I'll do. I'll create a world, and then I'll have some people to play with. That's idea of who God is. is not just laughable. It's rank profanity. Desperately blasphemous. Jonathan Edwards, the great American theologian of the early 18th century, he used to phrase it like this. He used to say that often Christians sustain an idea that God creates the universe, the world, God creates angels and human beings, God, God creates his, his, his order, and people think that he does that because he's substituting or he's, he's augmenting and supplementing something lacking in himself. And Jonathan Edwards rightly argued that God has nothing lacking in himself. God is the supremely self-satisfied, all-glorious being. And then Edward said this, what's interesting is when you're, when you're traveling through nature, you're going on a hike, or, or you're just enjoying some time in the outdoors, and you come across a natural spring in the ground. We don't see that a lot in southeast Queensland, of course, but in the American Northeast, that's not that uncommon. And Edward says when you, when, when you see a natural spring coming up to the ground, and sometimes they, sometimes they erupt, There's like a, it's almost like a blowhole, just kind of blows up out of the ground, and this beautiful, clean, fresh water begins to rain down. And Jonathan Edwards says, no one thinks there's a fault in the spring because it pours over. Such it is with a being who is God. Before creation, God is perfectly content, satisfied, at the consummate level of his joy, love, Happiness, satisfaction in himself, in the triunity of his being, and the love and glory that is intra-Trinitarian explodes into the creation of the material world. It's not there to augment or supplement a lack in God. God's love is not needy. And let me just say this so that we're all very clear about this this morning. If God's love was needy, you would not want anything to do with him. He would be a God unworthy of worship and lacking any dependability at all because a God that is needy is a God that is capricious and it is a God that is subject to change and mutability. Often we're confronted with this idea in the gospel. We think about the reality that our sins have been paid for in the cross, in the sacrifice of Jesus. But as we, as we kind of find ourselves alone sometimes and we're, we're, we're meditating on the gospel and we start to think to ourselves, what happens if 10 million years from now, in glory, God just suddenly just says, call it off. Every one of you now is going to be guilty for your sin. The, the capriciousness of a God that is needy and not dependable is not a God worth worshiping, nor a God you can trust, nor the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is perfectly, he's consummately self-satisfied. His love is not needy. God doesn't need you. 
The world wasn't created for you. The Bible wasn't written with you as its supreme object. You are not the hero of every story of the Bible. And you'll struggle to find churches these days that don't preach the narratives of Scripture with you as the hero. Like, you're the David. What's your Goliath, right? Like, you're the Samson. What's your lion? And then what's the jawbone that you reach out for and you use? And this kind of, this, this really bad exegesis perpetually platforms and props you up as the hero of every story and never truly confronts you with the limitation of your fallenness. With the lack that you and I have in and of ourselves, God doesn't need us, but God wants us. Not because we supplement anything in Him that He's lacking, but because in the joy and the glory of the triune God of Scripture, He seeks relationship with us. He seeks to pour out His love over us, the inexhaustible love of God. And that there is the purest freedom. That God spared no expense to lavish his love for you and on you. He paid the ultimate price to ransom you and I and reconcile us to himself in the gospel of his son. And that is pure freedom. So back to this point about the eternality of God's love. Like that, that dreadful hypothetical that after 10 million years in glory, we might all arrive at a moment where God says, all right, open the books of law again. Everyone stand before me. I've just decided that I'm going to judge you all on account of your sin. Now, that would be unjust. In fact, that would, that would violate what we understand as a, as a common legal principle of double jeopardy. If our sins have already been paid for in the death of Jesus, then God cannot require any of us that are in Jesus to pay for our sins again. The love of God demonstrates a permanence of God's redemption. The Dutch theologian Gerhardus Voss once put it so poignantly. He said this, The best proof that God will never cease to love us lies in the fact that he never began. Some of you thought you misheard me. Some of you thought what I said was, God doesn't love you at all. But that's not what Voss is saying. Voss is saying that to an eternal being who is God, there is no start and so there is no end. God has always loved you from the eternity past unto and into eternity future. You can never be lost if you're in the gospel. God's love is not needy. God's love is not license. God's love is not self-aggrandizing. But God's love, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, compels us. Let me read this text in the ESV. It uses a different verb. It says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The, the love of God, the principle, the object, the, the doctrine of God's love is not meant to exhaust itself in a moment of comfort that you experience. But according to the apostle... The love of God is meant to be fuel for our engagement in the mission of Jesus Christ. It's meant to compel us, says the apostle, to control us, to constrain us, and to drive us into the work of Jesus Christ. I want to share a story with you. The story goes back to the, the gold rush in California of the mid-19th century. The gold rush really sparked and hit its peak in 1849, that's why people in San Francisco are often called the 49ers. It's kind of a nickname. The NFL team's called the 49ers because when the gold rush hit, San Francisco went from being this tiny little outpost podunk country town to having thousands and hundreds of thousands of prospectors from all over the world end up in that place trying to dig and unearth gold and to make it rich. It's a true story of one such prospector who's an Englishman. He went out to California. In fact, he sold pretty much everything. He bankrupted himself. And he went out to the gold fields in order to make, him, make his fortune. <clears throat> and he was one of the very few, one of the very few lucky ones, after a lot of arduous digging and mining, to come across gold. Enough gold that would set him up for the rest of his life. He would never have to work again. He could take care of himself, his family, his relatives, distant relatives. He was well and truly set up. So he packed up the mining gear. He decided he was all done and dusted. And he thought what he would do was he would, take a, he would take a circular route around the continental U.S. When he arrives on the East Coast, he'll take a, a ship back to England, and he'll just live in the lap of luxury for the rest of his life. 
His, his circular journey around the US ended up at the Gulf of Mexico in a fledgling city called New Orleans. In 1850, New Orleans was one of the very last places where the tragic and horrific slave trade was still being engaged in. In fact, in New Orleans in this particular year, not only was a slave trade being engaged with uh, and, and was legal, uh, but there was open and public auctions for slaves. And this Englishman, having deep sensibilities about the reality of slavery, thought, well, I don't know, maybe I should go down and take a look. Against his better judgment, he did exactly that. The scene that was before him offended every fiber of his being. This cattle trade of slaves, of humans that bear the image of God, deeply vexed him. But he couldn't turn away. He couldn't walk away. He felt like he was glued to the spot. Now, as a tourist, what most tourists do is to go and visit the slave market, and that's what he did. And on being there, he finally realized that there was a young, beautiful woman that had now been brought up to the platform, and he heard the men as they were speaking about her, and two evil-looking men were bidding for her quite heatedly. Then he heard one of them say what he would do with her once he owned her, and this man's heart sank, and he fell to the point of vomit. On hearing this, and seeing the scene, his heart revolted against the whole thing. Finally, when the bidding of these two miscreants was reaching new heights in the auction, this man couldn't stand it any longer. He walked over to the auctioneer. This is a true story. And he secretly motioned to the auctioneer, wrote on a small piece of paper and handed it across, a figure of money that was exactly twice the amount of the last bid. Utterly beyond anything that had ever been paid for in that market for a slave. The auctioneer said, have you actually got that money? He came back and he said, yes, I've, I've got the money. So the bill of sale was made. This Englishman went over to the block to take the woman that he'd purchased. And as she came down one step and stood just about level with his eyes, she had a mouthful of phlegm. She spat right full in his face and hissed through clenched teeth, I hate you. He said nothing. With the back of his hand, he wiped the spit away and took her by the hand, walked across the street through the busy intersection until they came to the little office building. She couldn't read. She was quite illiterate, but she'd acquired enough English to have some form of conversation. He walked in and began to speak to the clerk behind the desk. And the clerk began to protest. The clerk insisted that it's the law. He said, I insist. Finally, the English miner returned. He paid some money. He took out a slip of paper. He walked over to the woman. who was like a beast ready to pounce on him. He handed the paper out to her. And he said to her, this is your manumission. Now, some of you... <clears throat> I'm not following the punchline because manumission is not a really modern word that we use very much. And much to your experience just now was precisely the experience of this young lady. She had no idea what he was, could possibly be talking about. She still hissed. She said, I hate you. And he said, don't, don't you understand? Here are your manumission papers. She said, this is some trick she hissed and spat on him again. He said, no, no, no. The manumission papers are your license to be free. I'm setting you free. She barked back at him and said, that's not possible. I already know, she said, no one's ever paid as much for a slave as what you paid today for me. This is some kind of a sick, twisted joke, some kind of sick, sadistic trick. No way you're giving me my freedom. I don't believe you. He said, these are your manumission papers. He stuffed them in her hand. And he began to walk away. And she was, she was frozen to the spot. Like all of, her, all of her rage and her anger was now disarmed. But she was in a cloud of utter disbelief. She was holding in her hand, scrunched up and maybe tears and sweat and spit all over it. It was the very legal license that permitted her to function as a free person. And it took her a moment to realize what was actually happening. 
She, she was frozen. And before she realized what was happening, the English miner was already halfway down the street. He was leaving. She ran after him. She finally caught up with him. She said, stop. Stop, mister, stop. Do, do you mean to say to me that you bought me to set me free? He said, yes, that's why I bought you, to set you free. Tears welled up in her eyes, eyes that hadn't known tears for a long time. And it spilled over. The stormy, firm face softened. And then she fell down to her on her hands and knees. And she reached down and grabbed those dirty old miner boots. And she's weeping and weeping and weeping. And she can't stop saying, you bought me to set me free. You purchased me to set me free. And then after a minute, two, three, four minutes of this, of this, this scene, which was getting quite awkward, the miner standing there in the middle of the busy street in downtown New Orleans, and people are looking on. It's a very bizarre situation. And finally, after she, she, she gathers herself and, and she pulls herself together, and, and she slowly looks up, and she slowly stands up, and she holds him by the shoulders. She says, you bought me to set me free? He said, yes, yes. He tried to tell her the story. I'm not a wealthy man. I grew up in, in the working class of, of, of the manufacturing plants and, and the factories of England. And I came out to, to San Francisco to try and make my wealth. And I struck gold. And now all of that has been paid at the auction to set you free. This woman, trying to digest, trying to comprehend, trying to, trying to process all that was going on. She looked at him deeply and said, Oh, sir, all I want in life, all I want in life is to be your slave because you bought me to set me free. Now, of course, this English miner didn't take her on as a slave. That would have defeated the entire purpose of this great philanthropic act. He went back to England. He went back to the factory. He lived his life in fairly destitute poverty. But he gave it all to liberate this precious soul. More valuable than the world is every single soul. He gave it all. And this is salvation. This is salvation. This, of course, is a, is a small microcosm of the grand eternal act of God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Heaven gave it all. I've often pondered this, and I'm sure many Christians have. What could God have given to show his love for you that cost him anything? What if he gave all the stars in the universe? What if he gave all the gold in the world? What if he gave you the thrones of empires and rulers and, and kingdoms? Would that cost God anything? But the good news of the gospel is God gave his only begotten son. God can't replace Jesus. God can't just beget another son from eternity past. God gave his only begotten son. God so loved the world that he gave. And as staggering as a, as a story like this is, is, is to us and how much this confronts us, it's almost unbelievable to think that this could happen. And indeed, it's a true story. But it is nothing compared to the love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at our text again this morning. 1 John 4, 7 to 9. In closing, reflecting on God's love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who has not loved does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. The incalculable sacrifice, the expenditure of heaven to send Jesus to save us when we were destitute, blind, poor, and enslaved to our sin is the motivation that Paul speaks of when he says in 2 Corinthians, the love of God compels us. Because we have experienced love, let us go forth and love. Let us make whatever sacrifice we have to make 
to see that the mission of Christ advances, the cause of Christ continues, that souls are coming in, hearing the gospel and receiving the good news of Jesus. Because God is love. Anyone who doesn't know love doesn't know God. And in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Let us pray together, shall we? Father God, we thank you so much for these few minutes we've had this morning to gather around your word, to meditate on the love of God. Father, firstly, what it's not, it's not licensed to sin. It's not self-aggrandizing. It doesn't, it doesn't make much of us. It makes much of you. Father, we thank you that your love is not needy. We thank you that your love is eternal. Lord God, we want your love not just to be a theme of our life, but to compel us to be on mission for Jesus, to redeem every opportunity, every occasion, every moment, every circumstance to demonstrate and share the love of God in Christ. Father, we thank you for this awesome privilege. I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't know the freedom that's in Jesus, may they know it right now. By receiving Christ. May where they are right now, as they sit, not think to themselves, what do I have to do? What do I have to change? Who do I have to be for God to save me? But just to know where they're at right now, that you're seeking to save them and for them to simply trust in you. Father, I pray that your word bears fruit. I pray that not only are souls saved, but believers are stirred to live out, to live out the great commission that's been granted graciously to us. I pray, Lord God, that Christ would be enthroned. And I pray, Lord God, that your word would bear much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.